Yeah, so the list that he's talking about are four strategic initiatives. We have uh, business retention, expansion, and attraction, workforce, housing, workforce, and uh, trust and partnerships. So thank you, David. Um, first of all, before I get into everything else, I have to tell you, I'm really honored for this past year to work with all of you and the board members that we have here. I mean, look across this room, we've got a bunch of talented people here, and I'm really honored to work with you all. Um, also wanted to just mention, I was told this morning that we have uh, someone who recently uh, received an award that I'd like to just call out here. Jim Nelson uh, was named the 2024 Wisconsin Tyson 100. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means, hopefully we can talk later. <laughs> but uh, congratulations to you. He's the CFO over at uh, Fort Hospital. So again, my name is Deborah Einhold, and I'm the president of Thrive Economic Development. Thank you all. I love looking around this room and just seeing all these faces. Thank you all for coming out. I know it was early, especially with some of you coming from distances. So, um, let me just catch up here. <laughs> it's been a busy and exciting year for our team and for Greater Jefferson County. And uh, that said, I'd also like to recognize our team here. So if you look around the room, actually if our team members could just raise a hand, I've got Roxanne in the back, Deb is here, and Julie likes to hang out in the very back of the room. <laughs> but if you could all give them a round of applause too. So as David or myself mentioned, we just launched our strategic refocus at last year's annual meeting. So the traditional economic development activities is specifically just business expansion, expansion, retention, and attraction. Of course, they're all still vitally important for us here in the development in Jefferson County. Uh, but the changing landscape of our municipalities and business communities compelled us to adapt. So conversations surrounding critical topics such as housing, childcare, and transportation, and I look at, at Tina, because of all the work that she and the, and the foundation have done on these things. Um, but they compelled us to adapt. So, uh, and our request strategic direction is a direct response to this evolving landscape. So in the last year, Thrive Economic Development managed 64 projects, and we resulted in nine wins and what I call two unassisted wins. So what are unassisted wins? I know that's not something people typically will, will talk about, but we try and be as transparent as possible with part of this whole trust and partnerships piece. So there are two projects that I worked on, actually put a lot of time and effort into, and they ended up moving on, having a successful outcome without our, our direct involvement. So, of those nine other wins that I'd like to talk about, um, one of those projects, I don't know if any of you have heard of a small company in Jefferson called Palermo. <laughs> So we were really excited that they, they decided to uh, choose Jefferson uh, for their expansion and as they promote, they're going to be producing an estimated 50 million frozen pizzas a year and provide nearly 200 jobs. So it's employers like that. In addition to that, we have an attraction project here, Sloan Bio, created Asplan Bio in the town of Asplan. They are an Irish company that acquired the former Valero facility. And they are going to invest nearly $500 million in that facility. So they have a facility right now in uh, Hungary. It's the largest biorefinery in Europe. And they're planning on replicating that. What they took, what took them 10 years to do in Hungary, they're planning on doing here in five. So look for them. If you've heard, I know that there are ads on the, on the radio looking for jobs. I think now they said they're up to 70 employees. So they're going to make a huge impact in our area. Conservatively, the wins over the last year represented more than $511 million, and I know when I told you $500 million of that is going to one project, I've got to tell you these projects are all different sizes, right? So $511 million in capital investment, at least 285 jobs. Supporting and assisting businesses that are already called Greater Jefferson County Home also continues to be an essential part of our work, with more than half of our project wins involving the retention and expansion of existing businesses. So housing has risen to the top as a primary focus for our organization. The reason for that is because these employers, as they are looking to expand, their workforce needs a place to live. We've had a number of employers who've come to us and said, hey, you know what, I hired this person, but they can't actually come here, and so now I might lose out on an employee. I can also tell you that with a vacancy rate of less than 2%, that those rental rates, and I was talking with Margaret a couple months ago, rental rates here in Watertown, are rising significantly, and that's because of, of course, supply and demand. So our work here is to try and uh, bring in additional housing. 
Um, and we're doing that in all different ways. So I should also mention, not only is our vacancy rate less than 2%, We've also had a rough market study done, and that told us that if uh, we were to build between 3,500 and 5,100 market rate units, they would be fully absorbed by 2028. And so the need here is huge. I know Ben has told me that other counties, our neighboring counties, even Waukesha County, um, Brown County, these counties have needs as well, but ours, proportionately, is way bigger than, than what they're experiencing. So we're trying to go through and uh, find ways to solve that problem here within Jefferson County. So how did we do that? Um, we had a task force made up of representatives from Jefferson County, Greater Watertown Community Health Foundation, and our organization. We began meeting in 2022 with three goals in mind. Increase the supply of available housing in Jefferson County. Support access to housing that's attainable to the county's workforce and promote development in Jefferson County by creating targeted local incentives that will support more than 500 housing units in the next five years. As a result of that, oh, actually I should follow the script. Uh, in May of this year, the task force hosted our first housing summit. So that happened actually on my birthday, May 18th of this last year. Um, more than 150 community and business leaders gathered to discuss the challenge and identify innovative approaches and solutions to address the need for additional housing options in the county. One of the innovative solutions that came out of the task force discussions is the Live Local Development Fund. And this loan fund is specifically designed to bolster housing development options, and this is housing of all types across the county. The fund currently has $3 million available for lower interest loans to incent development. We had, for our first round of applications, over $5 million requested. I have two additional developers who have come to me and said that they also have a need. So, Anyone has a couple million dollars lying around? <laughs> um, we are, our goal is to build this to attend a $15 million fund. We are still uh, working on, on achieving that goal, but it's something that we're really, um, it's really important for the county, and so it's something that we're going to continue to work So, um, before I introduce our panel, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our investors and stakeholders. So, if you're an investor in our organization, would you please stand? I love the scene. <laughs> so everyone, if you could just give them all a round of applause. Thank you. So this morning's panel discussion is about a topic that has far-reaching impacts on our communities, the availability and affordability of housing. We have the privilege of bringing together the leaders from three organizations at the forefront of this essential conversation. So as I say your name, if you wouldn't mind coming up, and I'm going to ask you to, to step to the front of the room to the chair. Uh, so Melissa Sanko is the CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Waukesha County, an organization that's been empowering families to achieve housing stability for decades. Del Darrow, over in the corner, is the Wisconsin Field Office Director for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, as most of you know. And as he also said, he's really thankful to get out because I believe you said not many people are looking for the federal government to come and say, hey, I want to give you some money. <laughs> Um, so they are the federal agency that plays a pivotal role in shaping housing policies and programs. And finally, Rebecca Drew, thank you, a Community and Economic Development Officer for the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority, or WIDO with an H, a state agency that strives to make affordable housing a reality for Wisconsin residents. So thank you all for participating today. So we have a list of questions here, and at the very end, I'm going to open it all up for questions for you all. So if you could just hold those questions, I'd appreciate it. So, uh, first, I've got a question for all of you. Can you hear me? Oh, they need a microphone, too. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. So, we'll start with Rebecca. So, can you briefly describe, and this question is going to be for all of you, can you briefly describe how your organization supports housing development and then provide an example of a project that your organization participated in that could potentially be replicated in Jefferson County? Thank you. Good. So, can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so Rebecca Jura with Vita, Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. So, housing is on our name. We are the state's housing authority, so we are in the business of affordable housing development. And I just wanted to throw out some terms. When we say affordable, as many of you know, it's that somebody is not paying more than 30% of their income or housing costs, whether it be their rent or their mortgage payment. So, typically, for Vita, um, we are serving households at 120% county median income or less, occasionally up to 140% 
from the get away from the glass. So just kind of throwing that out there. Um, so we have several different buckets to support housing development. The largest multifamily subsidy that we have is we allocate the state and federal housing tax credit program. Um, so I can spend hours, and I'm sure you did not come here to listen to me explain what housing tax credits are. If you want to know more about those, I would love to engage in conversation with some business cards over there. But essentially, it's equity in um, developments, um, as little as 25% equity up to about 60% equity, depending on the credit type, and that is equity in use in the project. Um, and the offset of that is the developers then offer affordable um, rents to households that are about 80% coming in income or less. Um, so we do several projects here. Um, we have a federal program as well as a um, state program, which is really great for the state of Wisconsin. Those can be for new construction, acquisition, rehab, adaptive reuse. And Jefferson County is actually just examples, and then we have one more huge bucket that we use for um, housing. And we also do multi-family lending for those projects, as well as projects that don't have tax credits. Um, so Jefferson County has been pretty successful in housing tax credits. So there have been 16 total um, development projects with housing tax credits in Jefferson <coughs> County. That's about 320-ish units of housing and about 275, 280, I can't remember the number, is affordable housing for those households. Um, the most recent project was awarded in Jefferson. Um, it is, well, in the application it was the candy slots, but it's the river sidewalks in Jefferson. So that was the most recent Foreman project. project. Yeah, the Foreman project in, in Jefferson. So that was the most recent project. And then in addition, we also are one of the largest providers of single family loans um, for um, households. So we work with banks and credit unions to originate the loan, and then we underwrite the loan, purchase the loan, service the loan through the entirety of the loan. Those are typically for households at about 120% community income or less. Uh, reduced interest rates for first time home buyers. We offer down payment assistance. We also have a home um, renovation program for current home buyers. Um, and for Jefferson County, year to date, so it's September 30th, year to date. Um, so 31 um, homes were purchased using a WIDA loan uh, for $6.4 million in investment. That's fantastic. Thank you. Now, yeah, before you go into this, I just, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to you but I also just want to let all of you know, so our organization historically had done counseling services for first-time home buyers and for rehab projects, and that work was all done through Roxanne. And uh, we had to stop doing that because I required the organization also uh, by, to be HUD certified. And so we've gone through that process, and we're hopeful. I was hoping maybe we'd get an answer before today, but we haven't. Um, but we are still pursuing that, uh, as you mentioned. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's great to be here. Um, I sit in your office a lot, and they keep telling me I'm supposed to be out doing it. Um, talking to people, and nobody ever invites me to come talk to people. So, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I don't want to be those people are watching the door and says, Hi, I'm here from uh, the federal government, and a uh, bunch of talents and they help you. Uh, we'd rather have the invitation so that uh, you're not worried about uh, coming out for some kind of enforcement activity. Um, Deb is correct. Um, and we're very happy. We talked about this about a year ago that she was in Japan. It's great interest in applying to become a approved housing counseling agency. We have about 12, about 13 now in the state. Uh, there's a great need for these all over the state. Um, our approved housing counseling agencies can I'll provide information and education to individuals who put them going to become home buyers. We've had this program in place for about 30 years. Uh, we're now requiring that um, all housing authorities and, and other entities that receive HUD money, um, we've now told them you cannot be counseling people about housing. We want them to know from people as well as our employees. Um, you need to go to a uh, housing counseling agency. You need to make uh, a relationship with that so that we have people who have passed the test that they've been certified as really knowing about what they're talking about um, to discuss this uh, issue with, uh, with people who are first time home buyers and people that may be falling behind in the mortgage. And this is one of the real significant issues of the private program as well. It's trying to keep people in the programs. Okay, um, so, and, and as they're moving forward on this, I want to say one other thing before I get down to this. Um, one of the programs that we have is called HOME, and there is a consortium made up of four counties here, 
um, Waukesha, uh, Jefferson County, Washington, and Ozaki County. Um, and the money can be used for a whole variety of different services. But it can be used for housing construction, and it can be used for rental assistance, and it can be used to support people at home. Life. Jefferson County is over 311, I think it is now that you have, that you probably have a little bit more ownership. That probably would be a question mark. So, I mean, I'll look at you. Just show me the, the relationship you have in three counties. And you're so far ahead of these other counties, even Waukesha County, using our home funds for, for home ownership. It's, it's really remarkable. It's really, really great. Uh, going back to the Housing Counseling Agency, I mentioned that as you move forward, one of the things I'd like to consider is the possibility of becoming an FHA lender. Um, Nonprofit and, and local government organizations actually can become FHA lenders. Um, not for full lending products, but for secondary financing. Um, there's an organization in Green Bay called NeighborWorks of Green, NeighborWorks Green Bay. Um, that has adopted this as well as uh, being a housing counseling agency. But they are a very active nonprofit organization in acquiring and uh, making storefront properties and getting them back into some commercial space. Uh, and they've also been very active in, in housing development and taking and making loans to, to individuals and in homes as well as um, buildings and new homes and taking old historic buildings and converting them. Either working independently or with, uh, with developers, low income housing tax credits. Uh, HUD is, I think, for the most part, most people think about HUD about public housing and our, our multifamily, our, our uh, multifamily rent assistance programs. We have a contract with the owner, as well as housing vouchers, um, where we can really make a big impact in the community um, is with housing construction. Uh, we do not provide loan financing directly to developers. We provide mortgage insurance. And so the loans have to be originated by a FHA-approved lender um, and then submitted to our office in all the uh, We can provide mortgage insurance loans for uh, rental properties for both the acquisition um, and rehabilitation of the property uh, with or without uh, renovation. Um, the construction, new properties that are construction, the mortgage loan for that. Um, and there was one other, I'm trying to think about this. Uh, but the other thing, uh, the two or three other programs that we have uh, are that um, the FHA loan program in which we can uh, provide funding for assisted living facilities, as well as um, housing cooperatives. Now, when we talk about these, most people think that HUD works with low income people. Uh, these financing programs uh, could be for high-end properties. Uh, we want you to think about that. Uh, and you want an example of a property? I think it'd be complicated. Well, that is when we talk about Milwaukee. It is the best example of, uh, of what I want people to be thinking about what you're doing in the community. Uh, if you've been down to the Bucks Cave, uh, there's a large, very tall building that's uh, just down there. Uh, that's called the Border. Uh, I've provided an FHA loan. Uh, mortgage insurance on that property. Uh, it's well over, I think it's $60, $70 million loan. Uh, it has commercial space, it has a large parking ramp for uh, the tenants who are going to get that property. Uh, uniquely, um, the developer sought to um, approval for air rights on the apartments of the clients with the FHA loan. Um, I provided the, uh, the opportunity for them to have their rights, uh, and they worked with the city of Milwaukee, which provided financing for construction on top three floors of housing high-end housing condominiums. Uh, the city provided for the financing for full construction of the condominiums, and they were repaid back in three years the full price of those condos some of which went for $500,000. So there are a lot of things you could do with our program. Basically what our insurance, mortgage insurance does is it allows the developer to get a low interest rate. Because we guarantee that if the property goes into default, 
we will pay the lender the outstanding balance on that. And then we will take the possession of the property if necessary and then sell the property. Thank you. So just so all of you know, there's a lot of details. All of these, we have definitely experts here. Um, so at your tables, you've got information. So for instance, Dale has an overview of the programs uh, right here. Uh, an overview of the programs that he's talking about. So don't get caught up in all of the details. Um, you've got them all there. And everyone else does as well. I believe Rebecca's information is over at that back corner. Um, and then there's other information at your tables for him. Sorry, what was that? All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Melissa Sanko with Habitat. And we, uh, you know, what we do in, that, in the housing world is pretty simple. We build simple, decent, affordable homes in partnership with families in need. So, you know, think back to when starter homes were built and maybe your first home. Uh, that's what Habitat for Humanity, our goal is to provide, is to help homeowners that, um, you know, are low or moderate income, you know, have that American dream that they can move in and invest in their home, invest in themselves, invest in their families, uh, save money, and uh, generate wealth over time. Um, so that, that's what we do. Um, our work is really focused around community revitalization. So we, we focused on revitalizing you know, maybe blighted areas of the city, um, you know, thoroughfares to downtown, uh, really activating uh, communities that you know, others maybe just drive by. Uh, we are also building our first ever subdivision in Dominican Park where we're building 20 homes uh, in the city of Waukesha, um, all on a vacant city block that sat, sat, sat vacant for over a decade. It haven't been even longer than that. So we're excited to be here today and we're, um, be part of this conversation as well. Thank you. All right, so the next question, why don't we start with you, Dan? Cool. Cool. Uh, Okay. Uh, so, in what ways does your organization collaborate with other stakeholders, such as local, local governments and developers, in order to meet housing demand? I know you talked a little bit about it, but if there's anything else you want to add? Uh, well, we collaborate in a number of different ways. Um, one primary one that we have is providing funding uh, through our community development block grant program as well as our home program to local governments. Um, in the particular case of the home program, uh, consortiums can be created uh, and they automatically get an entitlement. This is Jefferson uh, County, part of that consor or, uh, county consortium, receives an annual funding uh, for home monies from the HUD directly, so there's no grant application for that. The community development block grant funds that we provide to the state of Wisconsin, we provide block, community development block grants to uh, communities of 50,000 or more on an entitlement basis. Um, and to counties, um, I think it's 200,000 or more population, uh, excluding those entitlement communities. The, um, those funds can be used for a variety of purposes. The block community about block grant funds can be used for the purchase of housing um, and the commercial properties for conversion to, uh, to housing. Um, they could be used for uh, the purpose of uh, uh, public infrastructure, water and sewer roads, um, sidewalk improvements um, associated with that. Community of block grant funds cannot, however, be used for uh, actual housing construction. Um, but the funding can be used in a variety of ways. The other thing that uh, we Housing, we provide funding to housing authorities and housing vouchers. On occasion, a housing authority will decide to project base um, a housing voucher uh, in a particular property. They can either do that with a new construction property, they can do it also with uh, existing housing as well. It's up to the housing authority to make a determination of how they want to move forward on that. Uh, but that is a way to also work with developers. Uh, and to try to ensure that we have some opportunity to have some economic integration as far as mix of people living at a property. Thank you. Um, actually, if you would mind going down to Melissa, please. Uh, I believe you mentioned that, that uh, Habitat also takes advantage of some of the CDG programs. We do, uh, so thank you. Um, we do access um, CDBG program as well as the Home Consortium who has a meeting later this morning and work at one of my team members is going to be on the call at 10 a.m. Um, about some home funding. So 
It, it's one of the reasons why um, you know expanding into Jefferson County is, is such a no-brainer for us because we can you know activate the relationships we've already had with the local home home consortium. Um, but instead, in collaborating in generally, you know, we work with the local municipalities to find properties, to you know, solve problems, to um, you know, help with some financing with TIF with, or things like that. Um, but our biggest collaborator in our world is volunteers. So those corporate volunteers, those um, volunteers that are you know come out maybe maybe they're retired or they're you know turning over. Um, wanting to volunteer and give back to the community. So we have volunteers on our, on our build site three, four days a week and um, partner with banks and local businesses to kind of give back, swing hammer together, raise walls together uh, to serve families in the community. So that's uh, really my favorite as well. Absolutely, I can't wait. Rebecca. Um, yeah, so WIDA is a, a pretty big machine in terms of housing resources, but we can't do any of the work that we do without partners and without collaboration. Um, so you'll see a lot of times in these housing tax credit deals, there's eight, sometimes ten fun funding sources in the capital stack. Sometimes it's from HUD, from Federal Home Loan of Chicago. TIF dollars go into it, you know, local dollars like regional housing funds go into these deals. Um, so just us continuing in my in my area, especially with just community engagement, um, is just having these conversations, getting people connected with the right partners and the right resources. Um, you know, other agencies, WEDC has some grant funds with that can use for Brownsfield um, grants and DNR for site remediation. So just knowing what those resources are and in our group just sharing what those resources are to help communities, you know, connecting with banks and lenders to get the you know, mortgage loans in the hands of the, the um, home buyers that want to purchase loans and things like that. And of course learning from, from great case studies like what you all are doing in Jefferson County and then being able to connect those people with Deb or with others to learn from each other across the state um, as far as case studies go so we can help other communities as well. So the first individual question that I have here, and I've kind of granted this, so if you've got more information, hopefully you can share it. Um, so Jefferson County, as I mentioned, is in the process of becoming a certified. How will the certification benefit our residents? Um, well, it'll benefit them if they decide to come talk to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because what you're going to do there is you're going to explain to them about all the ins and outs of buying a home. Um, and what you need to be really thinking about um, to make sure that you have to financially secure and that you have purchase. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, we saw back in 2008 and 2009, this whole idea that uh, you know, housing values will always go up. Um, it's not true. I mean, people need to understand that if you're going to buy a house, um, it's based on market value. And so that there, you know, there is that possibility of people decline. So the other is, is that uh, to have sufficient uh, money, you still put all of your money into buying a house and not have anything left over in case your furnace goes out or for whatever reason, you know, you won't because it begins to leak or whatever, and you need to pass some money to do that. You can perhaps go out and get a second loan, but uh, you know, make sure that you have some money that's uh, still in reserve so that you can deal with that particular problem that you get into. And, so, and lastly, uh, you know, if you get to, to a situation where you've lost your job, um, you know, medical uh, problem has occurred and really even up all your costs and having difficulty uh, continue to make those payments, uh, you know, how to go to a lender to talk about that? And how to look for a mortgage uh, forbearance or adjustment uh, so that you can continue to pay that this is the really significant benefit that this is a housing council to bring to the community. Um, and the program also uh, provides for opportunity for counseling mentors uh, as to what they should be thinking about and how they should be looking at credit and uh, home housing uh, council. A group housing counseling agency could also make referrals or bring in as a partner some of the organizations that are working on money management issues as well as work with people um, so that they can prepare themselves to be a uh, homeowner uh, or to address those particular problems that they're in order to keep their home. 
So thank you, and that also is an important point. So previously, Roxanne was only doing the counseling for the home buyers and we have, but we have expanded. Uh, so when we get our certification, um, we will be working with counseling renters, helping them to find help, um, helping people to stay in their home pre foreclosure counseling services. So we have expand, expanded all of that. We can go into more detail on that. If you're interested, in each other. Melissa. I'll just add that because of housing policy agencies, we're able to help homeowners get on average about $20,000 in down payment assistance, and they wouldn't be able to get that if it didn't uh, go through an important housing counseling. So, you know, again, tying kind of all what we're doing uh, together. And 0% interest loans for rehab. There's a lot of really amazing programs that are out there, and those payments are deferred until time of transfer. So it can be really helpful for people who otherwise might not be able to stay in the homes. Melissa, um, so why did you decide to uh, expand into Jefferson County? Actually, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah, you know, it's it's all of you in this room, right? It's you. Jefferson County is doing some amazing things. You know, housing, home ownership, affordable housing, workforce housing. You know, it is is the top of mind. It's one of the, the top three things. It, it keeps bubbling to the top. Uh, and you, you've got so many things going for you as a county. You're ahead of many municipalities across the state. And you know, as a neighbor to Waukesha County, where we've been building for 34 years, you know, it was really like our board members would say, a no-brainer for us. You know, we were really excited. We've been working on growing the sophistication of our team. You know, we've, we now have subject matter experts on staff, especially in the construction department and family services. So we're ready. We're ready to build more. We're ready to, you know, put some foundations in the ground and, and swing some hammers. Um, and we're we're excited about just the momentum around these. I've, I'm probably looking at about a dozen different projects right now that might be our first pilot project, you know, in Watertown or Whitewater or Fort Atkinson or Lake Mills. And there's just really great synergy: public support, private support, you know, individuals, and there's plenty of families to serve. So we're looking forward to working with those families that work at your businesses, you know, to help keep things going. They're essential to your workforce, and you know, maybe keep them in the county, uh, and sleep in the county, right, and not just you know work here. Uh, so we're we're excited about that. And, and those are just a few. There's so many reasons. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. I hope you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so you've got an impressive goal of building, and Warren, I'm going to thank you for this. 20 new construction, 30 remodel projects, in three communities every year by 2033. So you get the 2033, 2033. Yep, put it together, right? 2033, yep. Yeah, so how do you choose which community your projects will be located in, and can you describe what the selection process is for people who are either interested in buying a home, or building a home, or getting their home remodeled? Yeah, 2033 is a really exciting goal. And so right now in Waukesha, we have about 10 homes under various stages of construction. So we're really well on our way um, to building 20 homes a year, 30 repairs a year in three communities. So, you know, the need is greater than ever. And if we don't take a big step out now during this crisis, you know, what are we waiting for? Now is the time to really to do more. Uh, and when we look at picking a community, we, we look at kind of that public, private support. You know, we we don't have um, real assertions on staff. We don't have, you know, folks that can just drive around and, and call, you know, folks who own property and, and ask them to sell. We really rely on collaboration for that. So I've, I've had the pleasure of working with some staff in the local municipality level to help us find, you know, those great lots and, and development opportunities for habitat. So that's, that's really a big piece. Uh, we, we do, just like all other developers, have a gap to fill in terms of what it costs to build the home and what we can sell it for. So TIP, tip funding, um, and consortium, things like that, all play into a factor of whether or not we can build in that community. And, and we are looking for uh, communities that have you know long-term vision, that can see where we can go in year one, but also year five, year seven, year 10, because we want to be a long-term partner. We don't want to build two homes and then move on. We really want to be a, a long-term partner so that our homeowners that are put into that into the community feel supported by other homeowners as well. So those are some of the things we look for. Great. And then what about the people who are looking to either get their home remodeled or want to build a home? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked. You know, we our goal is really to catch those folks that couldn't walk into their local branch and qualify for a loan to build a home. 
um, and to purchase a home. So we really want to catch the folks that have decent credit, not perfect credit. We'll work with them and their home buyer counselor on their credit. Um, but they, you know, they live or they work in the county. They have a stable job that they've been at for at least two years. Um, they qualify income-wise, so it's that same 80% AMI or lower. That's that's really our niche. And we find that our families are working in essential businesses in our community. So they are bus drivers, they work in senior living, teacher's assistants, local grocery stores, manufacturing lines, those are our families. And I think you can all appreciate that when you are you know, taking your parent to senior living, you want them to be cared for, right? When you're at the grocery store, you don't wanna to have to stand and self-checkout forever, right? <laughs> Um, you really want to be able to have a, a thriving community, and that's what our our families are. They're looking for a hand up and not a hand out. You know, they want to have a better life for their families. They want stability. They don't want to move every year, every six months, every year and a half, and their kids change schools. They really want to build roots, grow, and own a home. And so, they you know have a rigorous process of of, of family selection. Um, but probably what's most significant about our program is sweat equity. So our homeowners put in 200 hours of sweat equity. And some of that is home buyer counseling and financial education, but the majority of that is swinging the hammer, putting up drywall, learning about their house from the inside out, and working on the, their neighbors' homes as well. And, and I really think that's what makes our program so special, is because that sweat equity, that you know, really that investment, the blood, sweat, tears, love, joy, you know, they, they've seen it the whole way through. Um, so that's, that's really awesome to participate with, especially our volunteers to work alongside our homeowners. Thank you. All right, now you can pass it on to Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> it is, thank you. All right, so Rebecca, uh, the Wisconsin legislation has dedicated $525 million to support housing development. Hopefully you all feel that, right? Um, and redevelopment, which we will manage. What impact do you think this will have to address the housing shortage, particularly in rural counties such as Jefferson County? Yeah, that is a great question, and let's just all let that sink in. $525 million, that, yeah, that's huge. That is a big investment <laughs> in housing. So, so I know we're really excited about it. As you can imagine, these are completely new funding sources for WIDA, so we, our teams have been busy behind the scenes working around the clock to, to get these programs up and running. So there are four major um, acts that have been funded through these dollars. Um, three of them will be competitive loan programs. We have the Vacancy to Vitality, which focuses on the conversion of uh, vacant commercial spaces um, or just vacant spaces into housing. Um, one of them is the Restore Main Street, which um, focuses on creating second and third floor um, housing opportunities or even just some of the older second and third floor housing um, that we see. Um, and then the last one is the infrastructure um, loan program that we'll see to help with some of those infrastructure costs and housing developments. And then the fourth one um, is really kind of a whole buyer focused one or a homeowner focused one, which helps to rehabilitate some of those single family home loans. So for the first two um, that, that we are working on right now that will be available shortly here is the vacancy to vitality and restore Main Street. Um, so we have term sheets on our website. You can read the full act if you really want to. It's really exciting, um, which is also on our website. Um, and then you can kind of take a look at those term sheets to really familiarize yourself with how those funding can potentially be used in the county. Um, and then, of course, we will be having some um, video information sessions that will be posted, I believe, within the next week here on those two programs with the goal to get those applications for the first funding round for those two programs by the end of the year. So we're, we're moving pretty fast with those two programs. The infrastructure program and the home rehabilitation program will be, um, more information will be out and available um, probably mid-2024, if not a little bit sooner. Um, so I invite you all to view our website. We have an email sign up as well, too. So, anytime there's a new piece of information published about any of that legislation package, you'll get a little bit on that. Um, but to Deb's question about how that can help communities, rural communities especially, so in the three of the acts, the Vacancy Vitality, Resource Main Street, and the Infrastructure Loan, um, that there is a kind of set aside amount of 30% of those funds to go to communities of 10,000 persons or less. 
Um, so, so the legislation really does help drive those rural um, and small communities um, by setting aside some of those funding for those. Thank you. And I know Elmer said you guys were given this, you know, the legislation gave you 525 million and had some different bullet points, but left so much of it up for you all to try and, try and navigate and see what exactly would be the most beneficial support for you. So yeah, definitely. Good luck working for all that. Yeah, thank you. And like I said, we're, we're hoping to have those applications out by the end of the year for vacancy vitality and restore Main Street. So definitely, if you want to take a look and take advantage of some of those funding opportunities, they are competitive home programs. Um, definitely, your website. It's a great start. Mm -hmm. So the next question, actually the last question I have before I open it up to all of you, um, I'm going to ask each of you. So what advice would you give the municipalities trying to attract development to the community? Rebecca, since you have it, you'd like to start? Um, great question. And a lot of, when I get this question, a lot of the stuff that I would say as advice for communities, you are already doing in Jefferson County. So really, really great work um, with the partnerships that you forged and, and the housing fund that's coming up. And it's really exciting. And I know I've been engaged with several of you in this room. Um, but one of the things that you know, we, we are trying to really do is putting people at the forefront of these conversations. Um, when it comes to housing, we can all be pretty prescriptive in that language. You know, we need X number of units, we need X number of homes, we need X number of dollars. Um, and then following up all of those numbers that are so needed with what are we building housing for? Who are we building housing for? We're building housing for people, right? All people your parents, your children, yourselves, your siblings, your coworkers, so all people. So keeping people at those, the forefront of those conversations, um, you know, using language like, you know, X number of households in Jefferson County or whatever county you plug in, fill in the blank, you know, our, our rent burden, you know, or X number of persons that want to move into a county cannot because there isn't housing available. X number of potential home buyers can't realize their dreams because they can't afford a home to live. So putting those people at those conversations, I feel, is really beneficial. It can help really gather that community support needed for housing. It can really help spur excitement and passion that you all have. It can really help drive that movement forward to putting a dent in this housing crisis that we're all facing and can really help all, all households, all persons, at all demographics. So. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm old. I started, uh, working on, <laughs> I started working on HUD programs 51 years ago. Um, one of the programs that was in Mankato, Minnesota, uh, we had an urban renewal program. We tore down most of the downtown, the biggest state, uh, and then tried to rebuild it. Um, it didn't give up the full idea about uh, trying to preserve and, and convert uh, housing that is above commercial space that often in most communities now is no longer you know, being used. It is a real loss, and a real opportunity now with the program that's coming through the state. And I hope that you'll take a hard look at that and try to make that work. Um, the, the thing that I think is most important here with, with what the government is to understand as, as, as part of the economic development process is you're talking about businesses that's coming into the community so that you can also have projection for developers of what the projected need for, for new housing is, and to be honest about that, and what type of housing. Um, taking a look at your zoning and to see how that may restrict people, from housing, uh, especially people who um, would like to build single family homes. You need to have every house be 2,500 square feet and have three cars, garages. Um, that drives up the cost dramatically. Um, HUD, with our FHA um, single family program, uh, you know, we can provide uh, funding through that program for uh, loans up to $400,000. Uh, so it's not just a program for income people. Uh, the FHA program can have a down payment as low as 3.5% uh, people with good quality. Uh, yeah, it's still, but it could be up to 10% for people that have lower credit points. Um, Rebecca didn't talk much about the, the first time home buying programs that we had had, um, that including some of the $20,000 down payment assistance. Not quite 20, but. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's some really great programs out here. I heard from the book, almost a couple of years ago, 
is that uh, a lot of lenders are steering ahead of Florida to make a deal on the steroid town of Codex. So we get a better return on the and, and putting that together. So, I mean, really making uh, you know, individuals aware about uh, those different types of programs that they can use. To uh, one thing that uh, Milwaukee did uh, a few years ago, back in 2008, uh, they created an organization called Take Root Milwaukee. Uh, it was because they had so many more cultures going on, and they're trying to figure out how are we going to get people back. Homeowners, especially in you know, inner city neighborhoods. And it brought together uh, for the city, um, the, uh, the lenders, uh, realtors, uh, some home builders, and uh, another group of housing counseling agencies, and they're working in consortium uh, to go out and provide information. Uh, WISCAP, which is uh, the head of the Association of Community Action Agencies in the state uh, is now starting Take Root Wisconsin, and which they're trying to move to develop a, and try to promote uh, the creation of sim similar type of collaborative relationships in each county and each city of any size uh, to take a look at that and how can we work together uh, to make people aware of that. I think the other thing that could be beneficial is just to talk to your lenders within the community uh, to see if they're a group a VHA lender for those programs as well as a, 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 a WIDA approved lender for the WIDA program so if they want somebody to actually talk to them while taking advantage of the opportunities those programs provide. Well, Dale touched on a couple of the things. You know, what we did and built five, ten, yes. and three years ago isn't going to cut the mustard today, right? We have to look at zoning, we have to look at aesthetic requirements, square footage requirements, acreage, all of those things. You know, it, is that really what the modern family today is looking for? Is that really what uh, is going to build the tax base and sustain our community? So, you know, I urge municipalities to look at those things and you know, uh, think about how does the, the habitat product and how to do other developers, you know, fit in that um, that space. You know, TID, I, I said before, TIF, TID extensions is, is a really a wonderful mechanism to incentivize developers. And, and for us, we even use TIF funding for our repair program, so we're able to help keep homeowners in their homes, which, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about. Uh, so think about, uh, you know, extending those TID districts that are successful to creating a fund uh, for affordable housing, you know, for many years to come. Um, and, and I think for us, you know, the city of Waukesha has been a, a long-time partner, and, and they have a plan. They have a, a strategy. They know where they want different types of homes, different mixed developments, you know, brownfields being, you know, cleaned up and, and what's going to go there. And so we really kind of followed their lead. Uh, and helped kind of redevelop some spaces that you know weren't housing before. So, so spend some you know time really coming together with some plans that are localized to your communities. Uh, so that way, when habitat or developers come to people, you know, you can you can direct us to where we can make the biggest impact and and shorten that window from you know finding a property to getting the capital stack together. So that it, it's not you know it's so expensive, right? So that 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 timeline you know is much shorter. All right, so those are the questions that we have. You know, I was just going around the room looking. I think we've got six different banks represented in this room right now. We've got developers, we have municipal leaders. All of you, I think, I'm hoping, can take advantage of the opportunity we have for this panel here. Again, we've got an amazing group of panelists. So if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand up for <laughs> we, um, does this drive with the new certification and the local um, habitat have resources for Spanish speaking community members? We do. Our family services director is bilingual in English and Spanish, so we're, we're really excited about that. We have a Spanish application, um, we also have a Spanish home buyer session so for like a counseling if they're going through like a six week session actually have a, a spanish deck a powerpoint deck and uh Abilene can present that so i don't know that we have one that's specifically related but 
Hispanic, uh, the, the growing Hispanic population, of course, is really important for us. Um, and so, as some of you know, and I didn't even mention this in the speech, but all the work that we're doing with the Latino Academy of Workforce Development and the career fairs that we hosted, um, we've had great attendance. Actually, we've got our next one coming up next week, Thursday, down in Whitewater. So, um, we we are looking at having the information available in both English and in Spanish. And uh, at this point, those are the resources that we have. Anyone else? Sorry, come over here, then I'll come back to her. Hi, Nick, nice to see you. Uh, this is a question for Rebecca. Can you talk more in the mic? Chicken. Um, so it's great to hear that the state's given $525 million to you guys to, to steward. Um, the focus areas that you talked about, they sound really innovative, right? Trying to create more housing. But we're also seeing another crisis today. We're also building homes, and we can't get families in those homes because of interest rates, affordability, the cost for us to build a habitat. Have you guys talked about that at WIDA and tried to solution that problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I know, like Jeff had mentioned, with the legislation, you know, we're kind of find, found within a couple of boxes for what those funds can be used for. Um, but in terms of trying to, you know, combat the, the high rise of, of housing costs in general, um, you know, we have increased our down payment assistance um, to help some of those families out. We do offer reduced interest rates for first time home buyers. Um, we also do that for veterans. Um, and I know. Recently, because of the aging housing stock um, within the state, we have um, created a home improvement loan program, which allows current homeowners to take advantage of that to try to, you know, make those repairs, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not super involved in the single family side, so I don't know on new construction, um, but I have seen a lot of communities that are trying to research creative construction models that are less expensive, which does involve, you know, sometimes using habitat for humanity. I know some of the other um, habitats are using, you know, like pre manufactured homes and things like that. It would be a miss if I wouldn't mention our WIDA conference is coming up November 6th and 7th at the Monona Terrace, and our keynote speaker um, is really going to be talking about some creative construction needs um, for single-family builders and people that want to build a single-family home. Um, so she's going to be talking about that. Thank you. Here. Good morning. Got a question for you, Rebecca. But with the newest program, the loan program here for developers, I as a planner, I appreciate the criteria that communities must be in compliance, have an updated housing element, or make changes to their zoning. But with the timing of your program, there are there's a vast amount of time required to do those things at the local level, including public hearings, 30-day notices, all of those things, not to mention the local politics. Um, our, with, with applications coming up next month and being due in December, I don't think a lot of communities are going to be able to make the time frame to apply for this first round. Would you concur with that? And basically, they're going to have to position themselves for next application cycle? Yeah, so, so the plan um, is to have several rounds of funding. Um, because we know of the time frame that there will be, you know, some communities that might be able to, you know, get in in this application time frame, but there is also a few other rounds of funding for these programs that will come up. So there's no ability to condition the loan approvals because the community's in progress with something? That I'm not sure, but if you want to grab my card and email me those questions, then I will try to convince others with that conversation. So, yeah, Good question. <laughs> Any other questions? Sort of a comment that I'll try to formulate into a question, but I, I find it interesting that the Federal Reserve right now is trying to slow everything down, and you guys are all battling against that, trying to help people buy houses and develop projects and get into them. Uh, and a lot of our low down payments of the, and uh, things like that, and I'm really happy to hear that Counseling is a very important part of most of these programs. <clears throat> I guess I, my question maybe is the success level of the homeowners. You know, are they maybe high level? Are they staying in their houses? Are they able to stay in them and keep them, or are they bailing out? Because uh, that 
financially is an issue for them personally, but also on a bigger scheme, if the ball rolls downhill like it did in 09, it's an issue for the whole country. Which is one of the reasons why we were getting our house car HUD counseling, because we saw that coming. So, yeah, I can answer that because we have our you know, sample size right of our, our current homeowners. Um, so you know, what, one thing that's distinct about our program is, is the mortgage is 30%. It, it's a set number, so it, it's, and that's what's deemed you know, affordable. So it doesn't swing to 35, to 45, it, it's always that at the closing table. So it, it's, a, it's a fixed number. So we know that our homeowners can afford that, and that includes escrow for insurance taxes, and kind of these and those are, those exist. But we've built you know, over 50 homes, and we've, we've, I think, sold two homes over the years. So even our homeowners, they're, they are in good standing, but they don't even leave, right? And that's what we want. <laughs> we want our homeowners to live there for a long time. Uh, we, we incentivize that with kind of how we structure our loans, um, but we have the ability with Habitat to, if a homeowner comes in hard times, to say, all right, how can we recast this loan? And, and we, we definitely have done that on occasions, um, but it really is a, a track record that we're proud of. You know, it's, you know, 1%, I would say. Dale, do you also want to take a shot at that? Yeah, um, let's see. Um, last last fall, we gathered together some developers in the Milwaukee area to talk about uh, the issue of housing uh, construction. I would say uh, they know that the tariffs were a problem. Um, they noticed that the rising interest rates were a problem. Um, but one of the most significant issues that they raised was the lack of uh, subs that actually could be built by concrete and plumbing and others for the general contractor. And a lot of workers that could actually be performing that work. Uh, there's a tremendous need right now for people to come back into the construction business uh, and to, uh, to get new people in to the trades. Uh, this is one of the things that's holding up a lot of developments as well, slowing it down. Um, back in, again, back in the 1970s, um, um, we were in New York. We had a program called the 312 program, and at that time it provided a 3% interest rate. But that was just astonishing at that point in time that somebody would be able to get a 3% loan. Um, when uh, during the presidency of Ronald Reagan, and part of that with uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, we had tremendous inflation uh, as well as uh, uh, increases in uh, interest rates in homes. And it just is uh, at one point in time, I think. Uh, Mortgage rates were going for people who didn't have the greatest credit for up to 17%. My mother got a second loan at 27%. So when we're talking about loan uh, rates right now at 7%, those have been just you know, in the past pretty much the average. We've lived with some really good times the last few years uh, with, with, with rates at 2.5% and 3.5%. Um, and we'd like to get back to that. Uh, but at this point in time, I think, uh, from our perspective, we're doing fairly well and not seeing much in the way of foreclosures on our um, FHA single family loans. Uh, when we do have a foreclosure and pay off the lender, um, we then sell that property on the market. We've got a fair market value through our HUD home store. I go through our book through there, and we have hardly any listed in Wisconsin. Uh, so, back in 2013, 14, uh, we had a lot, and that doesn't make we had an awful lot. So, from that perspective, uh, you know, it's we're doing very well you with know, the state of uh, home ownership. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it just is a case also for additional subsidies and forms of down payment assistance on some of these homes, you know, working with organizations like Habitat or, you know, you know, providing down payment assistance and, you know, many of these down payment assistance programs can be paired with other down payment assistance uh, programs, you know, maybe locally or at your employer or things like that. So I think that's also another important to try to drive down that cost of the house a little bit um, so it's not as impactful. Any other questions? We're trying to find the remote. Yeah. It's a blinding light. I'm like, shit. I was going to say, it's just for me. Oh, there we go. Good. I think you just, again, you're Yes.
Um, so we're giving developers additional points for putting their housing developments in areas of high opportunity. So that is close proximity to good schools, um, that's close proximity to hospitals, to job centers, you know, and things like that. Because, you know, we have seen historically there have been communities that say, oh, we, we all agree that we want affordable housing, but we want it over on that side where no one has to see it. And, and that, that's the wrong way of thinking, right? We want to put people first and, and acclimate all families and all income ranges within those areas. And so that economic opportunity is a scoring category that we've done. We also do um, additional points for mixed income development. So if there are some market rate rentals within those properties, um, they can also get some additional points as well. Um, and then also encouraging developers to have more three bedroom units. So we do points for serving larger families. So allowing you know more families to be able to live within those developments because of the, the number of bedrooms sizes. Um, so, so those are a couple of the things um, that we've done um, with that. So um, I think there's a lot more work that, that can be done in that sense, but um, I think it's, it's really great and encouraging, you know, putting people first and, and bringing multiple different demographics together in the housing development is, is a really great idea. So this is totally off, well not totally off topic, but you were just talking about the QAP. Um, did I hear Elmer say last week for the developers in the room that that's going to be updated? Yeah, yeah. So we in the state of Wisconsin, we run on a two-year qualified allocation plan. So the applications that will be submitting applications at the end of the year through January will be the last year of this current qualified allocation plan. Um, so we will then be early 2024 rewriting the qualified allocation plans, so making modifications and things like that. And I know all of you as well. We typically do have some listening sessions where we collect feedback from developers, communities, lived experience persons. <laughs> provide comment and provide feedback on the qualified allocation plan. Um, so that's something that we'll be doing um, 2024. Um, and then that'll be for a two-year yeah. time frame. Yeah, I know that those are typically every two years, but it sounded like from what you were saying that they're looking at kind of restarting it. So taking a fresh look at the QAP. Yeah. Nice. All right. Any other questions before we turn on? All right. Thank you all. I'm going to pass it Well, good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Ben Waymar. I'm the Jefferson County Administrator. And so today is a pretty exciting day. Um, although you can tell they're here in presence already, but it's really the, the launch and the welcoming of Habitat for Humanity into Jefferson County. And so as you can tell from Melissa's passion and excitement um, for the top county executive variables, she's going to bring that to the table all day long with her team and the board for really help us as we move forward with the Jefferson County. And so Habitat for Humanity has a rich history of building homes and transforming lives. As you can hear from many of the stories that Melissa talked about today, that is true. Their commitment to create safe, stable, and affordable housing solutions perfectly aligns with our commitment to building strong communities and addressing our housing shortage. When we talk about housing shortage and the crisis, right, we're, we know it's across the board. And it's from our homeless population all the way up, right, frankly, to the C-suite housing and everything in between. And so this is definitely a gap that we appreciate the opportunity that Habitat's going to come home with us. So as we look, talk about our businesses and looking at workforce and those, those jobs that we was talking about in the presentation today, we really need that workforce housing opportunity. And so the expansion to our county's transformative step towards addressing this very issue, it also reflects the belief that if you live and work in Jefferson County, you should be able to afford to live here too. So at this time, if I could have the whole Habitat for Humanity team between the board and the staff members with Melissa, please stand up so we can recognize you, please. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you to Deb Reinhold and the whole Thrive team. We are really excited to be here. You've been such great advocates for our work and making introductions and you know uh, warm welcomes and, and things like that. So we, we are delighted and, and the team is really excited. And you know today is kind of our official launch and uh, you know talking with the community about about what we're hoping to do. Uh, but it's it's been you know eight ten months uh, in the making and, and for me 
you know, one of the first thoughts I had when I joined as CEO three years ago, um, I knew there was kind of a void of Habitat for Humanity in Jefferson County um, and an additional county surrounding us. And so it was one of the things on my mind uh, from the very beginning. So uh, thank you for helping this dream kind of become a, a reality. Um, so we, we look forward, like I was saying earlier, you know, we've been hiring uh, subject matter experts, right? We've been hiring folks who build hundreds of homes. We've been hiring folks who have experience in CRA lending, operational excellence, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, we've built over 50 homes, like I said, in Waukesha County, and we're looking at forward to doing more, to extending ourselves, to, to really scaling our work uh, to that 2033 vision. Um, and in addition to building new homes, because we've talked a lot about that today, is I'm really proud of our home preservation program. So our home preservation program is basically a repair program. It's predominantly funded by CDBG, Community Development Block Grant Funds, and it helps homeowners stay in their homes. We believe, and we've learned at Habitat, that it's just as important to keep uh, an older adult, a low moderate income family in their home that they've worked so hard to get then lose it. They are one leaky roof, which now is $10,000, $20, $25,000, depending on the size of the home. One, you know, super drafty window, one code violation away from foreclosure. And so our home repair program helps homeowners up to $20,000. So I, I joke that it's sometimes like, it feels like the roof repair program, uh, but that's if that's what the community needs, you know, that's what Habitat's going to provide. And, and the unique service we provide for our repair program is we kind of serve as the general contractor. Homeowners don't have the experience that you know some of the skilled folks in the room may on collecting bids and comparing bids and, and knowing just what type of materials that they should use. And so we hope to extend our home repair program here in Jefferson County as well. We're on our search for our first project. So I, I told you we, you know, I've got about a dozen things I've been looking at, but you know, this is a challenge to all of you. Where should we get started? Where should we have our pilot project? You know, we want to show you what our duplex twin homes look like, our three bedroom, our four bedroom, you know, and things that we haven't necessarily even built yet. Uh, and so this is a really fun project that Warren and construction staff and I have been, you know, to kind of drive around, learning, meeting the local municipalities, and just seeing where the opportunities are. And like I said earlier, we really want to be somewhere that has a long-term uh, solution for us, and that we're not just building two houses and leaving. And so, so it's been really fun to, to get to know folks in the community, to learn about the needs uh, and, and where Habitat can be. So shameless plug, especially if you own land, talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about that. But before we can begin construction, we have some fundraising to do. You know, I'm a professional fundraiser at heart, and it's, it's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to folks in the community about how they can invest in our organization. Our job is to invest in homeowners and so that they can build wealth over, over the long term, but we also need investors in Habitat for Humanity. So in order for us to you know, make sure this expansion is successful and long term, we're looking to raise $2 million in seed funding. And so that those funding will really sustain our organization for three years of operations. It allows us to buy trucks, trailers, you know, power drills, all of the things we need to be successful. And so, so that's kind of what we're, one of the things we're focused on first as in tandem with finding our first project is helping raise those important seed dollars so that we can not tax, you know, all the success we're having uh, and that we can only flourish and be successful. Um, and so one of the fun ways, and I'd like to invite all of you to join us, um, is we're hosting a Habit Tour, a bus tour on Halloween, October 31st. I know several of you are already signed up to join us, but uh, we're, we've invited folks from Jefferson County to join us and to see you know, our work at Dunbar Oaks uh, that we redeveloped the former YWCA, um, our, our work where we revitalized the main thoroughfare to downtown Waukesha on White Rock. We've got 17 homes going in there. You can tour a completed house. And then we are on the first phase of construction uh, for Dominican Park. So we have six units in our subdivision under construction there. So it's a great time. We've spent time getting to know uh, the communities that come get to know our work a little bit, they kick the tires and see, see our homes, um, you know, potentially meet uh, some, a couple homeowners. So I'd like to invite you uh, to join us in um, 
do, do not, don't you love affordable housing? So come join us uh, for a donut, learn about um, the bus tour, uh, meet some of our, our wonderful staff, ask us uh, easy questions, tough questions, uh, whatever it is, um, because we, we're just so delighted to be here. And, you know, I've had a lot of you in the room, but I look forward to meeting, meeting each and every one of you in the coming months and, and working towards solving this affordable housing crisis. So thank you so much. Enjoy the donut. Um, and thank you all again for your support.